So our next session is going to be led by Dr. Pat Russell from the Social and Human Services Division as she discusses implicit bias and microaggressions, recognizing and rectifying. So this series is part of the library because we see it as our charge to promote the freedom of information and open exchange of ideas. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Pat Russell. Let's give her a round of applause. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit more about how race and racism really affects us at a very personal, individual level. And then how from there that spreads out to, uh, to continue to reinforce the system uh, that we see. So, uh, okay, but before we begin, oftentimes when I have these conversations on race, I can tell you somebody in the room is probably going to get a little bit uncomfortable, right? Because I do believe that race is a social construct, but it was constructed so well that race resides with all of us at a cellular level, okay? Um, so when we talk about race, somebody's going to get uncomfortable. If you get a group large enough, say a group of two, Somebody's going to get uncomfortable when you start talking about race, okay? But what I do want to say about that is, is that I've never known anybody to be moved by comfort, okay? It's only by discomfort that we're moved. I've yet to hear somebody say, this seat is so comfortable, I just got to get up and leave it, okay? No. Okay. So I want some agreements about our conversation because people can get uncomfortable. Right? One is, is that I want all of us to be respectful um, to each other. I want you to set your own boundaries for sharing. Because remember, this is a conversation that we're having. Okay? Share only what you're comfortable sharing. Um, recognize your experiences as being unique to you, okay? not to anybody else. I want you to engage in dialogue and not debate. Um, we want to maintain a safe space, but I don't want us to confuse safe with comfortable. Okay? Oftentimes people will say, no, I don't, you know, we talk about race and people get angry, and that makes me uncomfortable. Well, if you're awake and paying attention and we talk about race, you should be angry. Okay? So, um, remember that your body language can be just as disrespectful as your verbal language. So please take that. And then finally, when we're talking, focus, I want us to focus on the impact of what's said, not the intent. And by that I mean, you know, somebody will say something, I have an example, somebody dropped the N-word in a class of mine, right? But they didn't mean anything by that, right? It, that wasn't the intent, but the impact was incredibly hurtful. So let's focus on that. Okay, so the purpose of this discussion is to broaden, um, to broaden the conversation about diversity and inclusion by addressing implicit bias, um, by addressing microaggressions, and how they impact all of us here at Seattle Central. When you leave, I'd like you to leave with an increased understanding of how our backgrounds, how our identities, how our experiences all um, combine to create our biases. Um, so I want us to be aware of how those are created, how they show up, and then finally, what we can do about it. Okay? Not just talk about it, but what we can actually do about it. Okay. All right. So when we talk about implicit bias and microaggressions, generally we're talking about the others, right? Outside groups. And those groups include race and ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation or ability uh, or disability, age, religion, and national origin. All of those things that aren't white, male, and mainstream. 
So what is implicit bias? Does anybody here know what implicit bias is? Has anybody heard of this before? What is it? Anybody? Yes, it's a subversive sort of um, perspective that affects our actions. Okay, yes. It's, it works on a level that we are not aware of. Implicit, inside, it's implied. Okay? And it refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, our actions, and our decisions okay? um, in a very unconscious manner. Now, explicit bias is those things, those biases that are very overt, those things that are just out there. Okay? So, to contrast the two, implicit bias is expressed indirectly most people are, well, it's implicit. You are unaware of your bias. It operates at a subconscious level, all right? So an example of that would be always sitting next to somebody that looks like you, right? Somebody that you're comfortable with sitting next to, as opposed to maybe sitting next to somebody that doesn't look like you. That might cause you a little bit of discomfort. Explicit bias is expressed directly. It's out there. People are aware of their bias. It operates on a very conscious level. So an example would be like, I like white people more than I like black people. Okay? That's explicit. People are aware of that. That's right out there. So how do we get there? We get there from our family, from media, from our friends, from past experiences, religions, institutions, and teachers. All of these things. All of these things in our past combine to form this type of implicit bias, this bias that we're not aware of. Now, I want to give you an example of how that looks. Okay, Brown versus Board of Education. Is everybody familiar with that? Right? In 1954, the Supreme Court said, no, these schools have to be desegregated because separate is not equal. Well, prior to that decision, a little known fact that Wendell Godwin, who was the superintendent of schools in Topeka, Kansas, sent letters to all the African American elementary school teachers that stated, if segregation dies, you will lose your job. Okay? And that's exactly what happened. So over the next 20 years, thousands of African American educators lost their job. It's estimated that up to 82,000 African American educators were ousted. And why? Because black schools were easier to close than white schools, right? It was easier to get rid of highly qualified African American teachers than it was to keep um, very unqualified, in many cases, white teachers on. Okay. So how is this implicit bias, right? It sounds pretty explicit to me, right? Okay, well the effects of those decisions are still with us and not just in desegregated schools, right? Because if you'll notice, a lot of schools are becoming resegregated pretty quickly. But from 1975 to 1985, the number of African American students majoring in education dropped by 66%. 66%. What happened? Why did that happen? Okay. Because African American students did not see themselves as teachers. They did not see that. That is an implicit message. And that message was loud and clear. This is not for you. You cannot teach. You cannot be an educator. You cannot go on. White students didn't see faculty of color. They didn't see uh, black teachers, or brown teachers, or red teachers, or yellow teachers. They only saw white teachers. So what was the message that they got? That this is for me, and it's for me alone. Okay. So oftentimes, and this is how this sticks with us, I did not see a teacher that looked like me until in 1975 I came to this school. And it's the first time I got to see a black female instructor. That is how it's still with us. My name is Pat, right? I am a psychologist, I'm a doctor. 
When people read my name, okay, and they see my title, they automatically assume what? White guy, right? And when they see me, I've had people get absolutely pissed off, like I tricked them, right? I went and got this degree just to make them mad. I've had people say to me, no, I, no, I'm sorry, I was looking for Pat. I'm like, that's me. No, I mean Dr. Russell. Yep, that's me. That's implicit bias. That is the message that comes out of actions like this. Okay? And it's still with us today. So some examples, then, of bias that happens in higher education. Right? How can it happen? So we have these ideas, they're in us. Right? These biases that say certain groups of people are less than. Certain groups of people can do things better than other groups of people. But we wouldn't dare say that. Right? A lot of times we don't even know that exists, but this is what's happening. This is how it exists. So can you imagine having that bias and advising somebody? What's going to happen? What are you going to advise them to do? Student and faculty relationships can get impacted, right? Both ways. When white faculty are working with students of color and this bias begins to creep in, grading happens. Right? Um, who you're going to assist in a classroom happens. What you consider to be good academic skills happens. Okay? And the flip side of that is white students dealing with faculty of color and, and being very resentful if they don't get the grade they think they deserve. Um, there's a very, very interesting research out there that talks about um, student evaluations um, with faculty of color, particularly women and how negatively it impacts our careers. Um, our daily interactions, or lack thereof, with students. It's important that you have access to faculty. So, can you think of some others? Yes? Very good, disciplinary actions. And you can see that from elementary school all the way up. Yes? I don't know about here, but I remember in high school, the kids in the leadership positions. Yes, exactly. Leadership positions. Definitely. Yes? Um, student interactions with each other, like forming a study group. Definitely. Like yeah, that. study groups. You begin to see students that look alike studying together. Scholarship opportunities. Scholarship opportunities, big time, big time, okay? So these biases that are in all of us, that are in our institutions, because that's where we are, affect us to this very day. Okay, so how do we work on something we can't identify, right? You're saying that implicit bias lies right beneath the surface and we can't, we, we're not aware of it. Right, somebody um, once explained in implicit bias is if we knew what we were thinking, we probably wouldn't invite ourselves to dinner. <laughs> we just can't come right out and say, I'm a bigot, yeah, say it loud. No. Okay. So how do we do that? We begin by actually identifying. Each and every one of us needs to think about our values. Where did they come from? How did we get them? Who gave them to us? Um, who do you value and why do you value them? You really need to think about that as well. What influenced you growing up? And what influences you today? Who are you most comfortable with? And who are you the least comfortable with? Because oftentimes these are those little clues that let us know what we're thinking and what we're feeling. There's also very scientific ways to measure bias, all right? And a lot of times when I ask students to do this, I get a lot of pushback because they will actually go take this thing. It's called the IAT, the Implicit Attitude Test. 
It's out there. It was developed by um, a professor at the University of Washington and one at Harvard. This is one of the most researched um, methods for getting at implicit bias that there is. And a lot of times people take that and they don't like the results they get, right? So you get all these arguments, like Dr. Rosen Dutt wasn't fair, okay? <laughs> Yeah. No, but it did measure, right? It measured what you're thinking. Now remember, bias is there. We really can't help bias being there. But once it gets there and we know it's there, that's how we begin to work on it, okay? So I would tell everybody, and um, I'll send this to the library, to go take that test. It's up online, it's free, I want you to take the test, and I want you to look at the results. And I want you to think about those results. Um, was the information new to you? But the other point to that test is even people of color should be. Yes, <laughs> especially people of color. They are not yes. biased. And yes. there's so much bias when it comes out to people of color. We internalize so many of these messages. Again, if you think back to the drop, 66% drop in African American students going to education. We got the message, right? I think that when I, if, if we're thinking, if it's the same test that I took, I ended up having a bias towards white people, and I was, I was shocked, yes. and I'm now yeah. more aware that that's something that right, I'm right, process. right. And we are surprised when people of color see something like that, right? But again, we get these messages, and we get them loud and clear. I mean, when I think about um, the presidential race that's going on right now, there's some loud and clear messages, right? Nobody's saying, well, I'm a bigot, but everybody's acting like a bigot. Right? So, you know, that's that implicit bias. It's very interesting because when you ask a lot of people, why are they supporting Donald Trump, they, they go, they can't tell you, they can't give you a coherent, a coherent answer, right? Because on the surface, come on, what is this guy offering? Listen to him, he's saying nothing but a lot of bigoted stuff. And there are a lot of people connecting with that. And some of those folks aren't even sure why they're connecting, but they know it's speaking to them. Okay. That's implicit bias. So it is important that you, that you take that. And when you do take this test, I want you to understand it's a snapshot in time. It's how you are feeling now. I've had students take it and then take it again a year later, and they've seen dramatic results. But you can't work on something if you don't know it's there, right? It's kind of like privilege. Privilege is very invisible. You really don't miss it until somebody tries to take it from you, right? You don't miss it, you don't know it's there until somebody points it out, right? Okay, so I would say that everyone, especially in higher education, needs to have this somewhere in, in your briefcase, in your background, on your CV, okay. Okay, so how do we get from implicit bias to microaggressions? So what's a microaggression? So is it when the implicit biases are then internalized to make, them, make their ways out and manifest in different ways? Most excellent. Did everybody hear that? That's when those implicit biases manifest and make their way out into the world. Okay? Right. Those, I didn't really mean it. Okay, oh come on, you're being so sensitive. Right? Stop. These are the everyday verbal, nonverbal, and environmental slights, snubs, or insults whether they're intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages um, to target persons, right? based solely on what is perceived as their identity. Okay. All right. So this is okay. So this is what it looks like when you have micro. Um, when, you, when you get to get to a microaggression, you've got implicit bias, you've got stereotypes, you have prejudice, you have discrimination, you have it systemically. Okay? These things combine and they show up in the form of microaggression. Okay, I want to look at this for just a minute. There is a project called, um, well I'll show you, it's out of Fordham. 
University. I don't know if you can see this, but these are real students at Fordham University, and um, Denise, if you can just kind of go through it. Um, stop, stop, come back, come back. <laughs> okay, thank you. So these are real students, and they were asked, this is from a Tumblr, they were asked um, to talk about their microaggressions or to make signs of what they are. And so these are some of them. And this first one says, what are you, human? Being biracial doesn't make you a what? Okay. What are you? So what do you guys speak in Japan? Asian? <laughs> you don't act like a normal black person, you know? <clears throat> Courtney, I never see you as a black girl. She has a hashtag that says, open your eyes. Just because I'm Mexican doesn't mean that I should be the automatic first choice for the role of Dora the Explorer in the high school play. So, like, you're, what are you? You don't speak Spanish? No, 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 you're white. When people think it's weird that I listen to Carrie Underwood, I have a confession, I don't even know who Carrie is. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. This girl sitting next to me moves to sit closer to someone else she's talking to, and this white guy whispers loudly that she moved because I smelled like rice. So, what does your hair look like today? She said as she pulled off my hat without my permission. All right, I'll bleep this one. Not your effing China doll. The limited representation of my race in your classroom does not make me the voice of all black people. Huh? So you're Chinese, right? You're not really Asian. When standing next to my mom, why is your daughter so white? When I gave a speech about racism, the MC introduced me as Jaime Garcia. My name is Jaime Rodriguez. Not all of us are named Garcia. You're really pretty for a dark-skinned girl. Can you read this? And then he showed me a Japanese character on his phone. Why do you sound white? Can you see as much as white people you know because of your eyes? So, thank you. All right, these are microaggressions that happen to students all the time. Okay, so in higher education, microaggressions happen from student to student, from staff and faculty to student, and from student to faculty and staff. Um, keep going. This is actually, uh, it's a great little piece. I don't think we have time for it, but it's a, a little uh, YouTube of uh, people sort of acting out these microaggressions. And if you have the time, you should see it. It's funny in a very painful sort of way. Okay. So here are some examples of microaggressions that I've heard and others have heard in higher education. You're so articulate. Right? Um, your English is very good. Maybe science or math or psychology, maybe that's not the field for you. Okay. Are you sure you got this paper? I don't see color. Okay. I had somebody say that to me once because I kept raising my hand and this person would never call on me. 
And she kept saying, well, I really don't see color. And I said, obviously you don't. Because every time I raise my hand, you don't see it. Can you, wherever you may be, tell the class about, right? Pat, can you tell the class about the experience of black America? No. <laughs> I don't think of you as. And this one, and oftentimes I hear it student to student, you should or you shouldn't be more assertive. Right? That is so culture-based. Right. And you don't have the right to tell people how they should behave, what is acceptable. Right. We come from many varied backgrounds and we learn in many different ways. And that's what makes the academy so rich, are all of these things coming together. Okay. Not exclusively, but inclusively. And that's how we learn. The impact that microaggressions has on students is really interesting. So I have this one little piece. It's showing that microaggressions have caused students to, quote, feel excluded and lack a sense of belonging, drop a class, change their major, and even leave a university to attend school elsewhere. And I will tell you, some people just leave, and they don't come back. Because again, they get that message through these microaggressions, through implicit bias, that this is not for you. This is not about you. So how can faculty and staff begin to support um, students of color and other marginalized folks? You need to begin to recognize the whole student without the student having to bear all. It is your job to support that student, to find out what that student needs. You need to recognize how culture and identity matter in the student's experience and the institution's perception of that student. How does this institution think about students of color, about gay students, about lesbians, about transgender, about students with disabilities? Okay. If you walk into a building and you see all stairs, what does that tell you? It's not, we don't, if you're in a wheelchair, you don't matter, right? If you walk into a building, and I've seen this at the University of Washington, you walk into a building and you see the recipients of certain scholarships, and they're all white guys, right? What does that tell you? There's no scholarships here for you, okay? Our environment has those microaggressions as well. So really being aware of your classroom and being aware of what's going on in the institution itself. Partner with students, leveraging their strengths and their resources. Find out what they have to offer, not what you have to offer them. Okay. Don't dismiss a student's circumstances, experience, or realities. That, oh, get over it. Okay. It's really not that serious. It's not that important. Provide direct and individualized diverse support within the school community. Be open and receptive to feedback. And finally, because of systemic racism, we need to make sure that school is affordable for each and every one of us, okay? Not just the sum of us. And once we get here, we need to make sure you can continue to afford it. Textbooks are ridiculously high, and they're exclusive, right? Okay. So we need to think about that, and think more about open source as teachers. For all of us, what can all of us do? So continued education on the experience of diverse students, of those students around you. Be mindful of your personal biases. Check yourself. Ask yourself about your values, about your history, about where you grew up, about who you saw teaching you and what that means to you. Take the IAT. Take it. Um, ask yourself. What don't I know? What am I assuming? What could this situation be about? Don't ignore the obvious. Address issues as they come up. Don't try and sweep them under the rug. I have a 24-hour rule because sometimes I get very angry, right? 
but I give myself 24 hours to cool down and then to address it. Okay? Because even though I have that anger, that doesn't mean that that issue does not need addressing. Be visible and engage. Build relationships and trust. Be mindful of triggers. Okay? Those, those words, those events, those historical things that come up in class that may trigger certain experiences. Don't dismiss the experience of others, even if you don't agree or if you don't understand. Okay. And hold each other accountable. That is the biggest thing. We need to be able to hold each other accountable. For all of us, continuing on, we need to be inclusive with planning and opportunities. That means hiring opportunities as well. Students need to be able to see people that look like them, that sound like them. Recognize culture and diversity when bringing in speakers and performers. And when I say bringing in speakers, I don't mean just during Black History Month, okay? I mean, let me give you an example. My background is in psychology, and the only time people wanted to talk to me was during, what, Black History Month, okay? Um, but I have a doctorate in psychology. I can come in and talk about psychology. So be mindful of who you invite in and when, okay? Be inclusive. Continue to have these conversations. Continue to advocate. Continue to work through the discomfort. Continue to talk about it. And most of all, please continue to make the noise because that's how you're gonna make the change. Okay? So, questions and answers. That's it, yes. <laughs>
like taking it into like more of like what would be like a legal realm or something mm -hmm. where like how do you I would yes, I would document. I think is that what you're asking me? If this continues to happen, I would document it. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, and again, find advocates. And, um, don't try and go it alone. Is the first thing I would say. Find allies. They do exist. Okay. Yes. Uh, the one the connection about this good point. You know, the high down with the box and you being right. It's like because if you're, if you're going to the deeper, like. So the boss is your boss, obviously, and mm -hmm. you're working because you you need to work, you need to make a living right. and whatnot. Right. And so you're trying to find that balance. Okay, I really need this job. Mm -hmm. This is the pipe down. The right. pipe down. And that is right. my boss. So if I step over his or her, it's kind of like you know their their uh, perception or whatever it is. Right. Then I could fear losing my job. Exactly. So it's like. Exactly. I, I mean, I, I've learned, like, I mean, it's kind of like, what I've learned, you consent to some of this, you know, some mm -hmm. of us, we don't agree with it, right. but we know that in order right. for us to keep that job, we have to. We have to. We put up with those microaggressions, yeah. and we know it. So, right. uh, yeah. my question is, what, you know, what do you think about how, how can we kind of, like, go back from there, like, you know, what are some solutions? I think some solutions, first of all, are finding support for yourself, okay? That's the biggest one. And to continue to advocate for change. Remember, there's there's numbers, right? And that's what makes movements. Right? People getting together. Unfortunately, I can't hand load, I just can't hand an easy solution to that power differential, right? Because most of us live under it, right? And that's how they keep it, right? Because we are afraid. We don't want to say anything, right? So there are times when you do have to step up. And you do have to step out. Okay? But make sure you have some support when you do that. Don't try to do that by yourself. Yes. So I was wondering, uh, we sort of see like microaggressions, like let's say in classroom environments, um, but it's not directly impacting you, but it's, direct, it's impacting others around you. Mm -hmm. What is sort of like the best way to post that? You talked about maybe gathering other people in class, mm -hmm. garnering support. It gets really confrontational. Especially it's faculty and student relationships. Right. Right. I mean, I would feel defensive. I was if you were the faculty and you were doing it? Okay, well, as faculty, I think we need to step up. And if somebody tells us we're you know, guilty of a microaggression, maybe we need to sit down and talk to them and listen to it. If we're seeing it in a classroom repeatedly, it is up to us to say something. I think the thing is, is that we all get scared into silence. And as long as we stay scared, then it's going to continue. It's going to be okay. It is hard work. I cannot tell a lie. And yeah, you may lose a job. And you may get somebody angry at you. But I think each and every one of us has to decide, you know, when is it time? When is it enough? I think what you were saying plays into what you were talking about too with not dismissing another person's experience. Yes. Because in my experience confronting people, their first instinct is to feel attacked and to right. dismiss it. Right. Like, well, I didn't see that. Mm -hmm. Well, a point to someone, well, they didn't see that. Right. What you're feeling must be invalid. Right. So we have to ourselves not, right. not make the person feel attacked right. and make sure that nobody's experiences are being dismissed. Right. And, and also, make sure that those people understand, I'm not calling you a bad person, right? But your behavior needs some adjustments, okay? And you need to understand where that behavior comes from. We're educators. But it's also different too, um, right? It's a diff like difference of like how race plays in with like microaggression and like the difference between like like microaggression towards white people versus microaggression towards people of color. Like mm -hmm. there's systems that like aren't mm -hmm. ever like aligned with you or right. ever in your favor. So like right. sometimes it's like you have to like you have to just like stay and like keep that shit internalized. And like for white people, it's like the systems are always aligned with you. So no right. matter what you do, like right. you're gonna find another job and you're gonna find like mm -hmm. all these other like. Accessibility, like ex 
access and right. like it's because you have like privileges and like right. the fact that you as an ally like can actually um, talk about it but you choose not to because right. that's like a luxury right. and a privilege right. to not talk about it right and for people of color it's like you have to like yes. you have to like you have to just like internalize all of those like even right. when you know like right. um, even though you want to say like and mm -hmm. scream at the top of your lungs mm -hmm. and like you know like enough is enough like right. I freaking quit my job because at that like <laughs> And again, we have to make those individual decisions because I don't want to be up here telling everybody go quit your job. Exactly. The minute, you, know, you can tell your teacher to go kiss your mm -hmm. but, <laughs> if, you know, but okay, I don't want us to think that we have to internalize that because we keep internalizing it, it's gonna stay there. And you know who we're gonna hurt? us okay and you're right how do we begin to change that system how do we begin to change that system yes, sir. Um, so I think one thing that helped me uh, when I was a, a young person was that um, and this is a long time ago when email was first getting popularized so uh, um, was that I had a supervisor uh, who was we didn't call it microaggressions back then but that's essentially what he was doing. And um, so I remember uh, writing him an email. And so my suggestion would be, do it in writing, text. Mm -hmm. All that is open and legal, and, and they can't say, well, she never told me mm -hmm. that this was offensive, or they'll, right. you'll say, well, actually, right here. Right. Um, and that's at a, uh, I think at a practical level because oftentimes we need those practical suggestions mm -hmm. to make more concrete these more theoretical concepts. Because if you do end up going into a, a lawsuit or something, mm -hmm. you need that. Because <coughs> they won't, yeah. right? Because they won't right. believe you. Right. Right. They'll probably believe your employer before they believe. Yeah. You. Yeah. Keeping paper trails is a really good idea. Yes. I always have a huge time addressing like microaggression or biases that I think are against me because I'm always I always second like, guess myself that they even happen. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I'm so like shocked that it could like if I see a pattern mm -hmm. specifically with like professors at the school. Yes. Or like I'm never late to class. The one day I'm late, he like outs me in front of the entire class or so we'll in. Whereas a bunch of like people are late all the time to this class mm -hmm. and nothing's done and I'm just like, well maybe that's just Maybe they're having a bad day, like right. maybe, yeah. right. you know. But I, so I just, I never know. And it's like because it's so, it's not a concrete idea. It's, it's pretty abstract. It's right. small. But I just, I don't even know how to, right. how to do something about that. I don't know. Right. So when again, when do we speak up? When right. do we become concrete? And that's one of the very insidious things about microaggressions. It makes us doubt. Right? Did I just see that? Did that really just happen? We begin to doubt ourselves. Not the perpetrator, but ourselves. Um, I also think that, you know, listen, listening is also critical. Yes. Because it's one thing for you to hear what that person's saying, mm -hmm. but it's another thing to listen to what that person's saying. Very good. And yeah. so, like, I think with, like, the Mike question you mentioned, like, because these are more, I think these are more right for you, like, years like yes. years, these things that have been happening yeah. historically you know yes. and so it's kind of like i know that being being for you know social change and whatnot things it, it, it develops slowly you know it doesn't yes. happen overnight right but it's just that like i really feel like not a lot of people are really listening to you know what what are some of these uh right you know key points are you know right so we need to listen more i think right. that's what we need to work on right mm -hmm. So he's saying that we need to listen, really listen, not just hear what's being said, but to really listen to what's being said. Denise? Um, I think the whole power thing can be really scary because sometimes with professors, like some of them yeah. have tenure, and you know, it takes a lot to get them fired, you know, whatever. <laughs> Maybe we can address their issues, but there's like a lot of racism within the school system. Just within even college textbooks, I see so much bias, and I'm like, that's yes. not true. Yeah. 
Yeah. And yeah. one thing that we can do is empower ourselves and keep coming to school. Don't <coughs> drop out. I almost dropped out because you know I feel like I belong, and then I'm like, no, that's why I'm here to right. start making changes. So I mean, thank everybody for coming. Yeah. Um, I think it's important that when you uh, start to have these conversations or you start to feel uncomfortable, you'll know when you need to have that conversation because you'll feel it. Uh, so That's you should right. check in with yourself and be honest about it. If you're going to have the conversation, it's important that you are not only advocating for yourself, but advocating for the other individual that you're trying to have the conversation with to make right. it a safe space to have the conversation. Right. Because otherwise, it's not it's going to be ineffective. It's not you can you can look at life as right or wrong, or you can look at it as effective or ineffective. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're effective at communicating, it'll be positive mm -hmm. on your outcome, right? Because that's what you're looking for is to have the individual understand where you're coming from. We right. don't want to fire people; you want to change them, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, and see if you can work more right. to to be positive on communication. So thank you. I just want to say sometimes you can challenge the teacher because I had a teacher who told me once because I'm African, you can drop the class because I don't think your English level is up to that class. I was hurt because my grades are good. I have 3.0 up to 3.4.0s. I know I, I have a confidence in myself. I went to his office and I sat down with him. I said, I understand your point, but know that I know you, you know. Otherwise, you wouldn't be teaching. And I want you to teach me what you already know. Don't just look at me as someone who doesn't understand you. I do understand you. I want you to teach me what you know. And everything changed. You, you really need to step up and have confidence in yourself and dis dismiss all of what the society is telling us. You, you're black. You're inferior. You're not educated enough. The, the social construction that we, we embed it is not real. It's fake. Right. Thank you. So, uh, I got one more question. Um, I find myself in a lot of meetings around faculty and staff, and I catch myself, you know, uh, watering down my language more and more every single time I'm in a meeting. So I start using words like equity and anti, you know, like more inclusive and diversity. And uh -huh. so, can you know how? So it, it came up during the meeting, just like, uh, Kevin, just say it, like, it's anti-racism that you're trying to communicate. So uh, is it like a microaggression, or is just the culture or the climate where, you know, people of color are in the rooms of, you know, these professional settings, mm -hmm. and you start finding yourself, you know, getting with the language, yes. and, and, <laughs> and like, basically, you're just coding to where you're so watered down, like, what, you're just, you know, you're just butting in at that point. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, is that considered a microaggression, or and how would what would be the best way to address that mm -hmm. and to combat that while you're still taking up that space as a person of color? Right. Great question. It is a great question. Um, I would call it racism, mm -hmm. just straight out. Um, we need to call it what it is. Um, the way we language things now, I like to think of it's now high tech racism. We're, you know, we're very careful, we've got these legal documents, okay, and we all sort of dance around, right? We talk about diversity and inclusiveness and multiculturalism, but we don't talk about racism, okay? And that's what we need to be talking about, is racism, right? Don't let it go. Don't let it go. And it is, it's very easy to slide into that, you know? And I want to be her too, and I want to be professional, <laughs> crisis or negativity as an opportunity instead of because if you don't ever see it as a way to push through. I do that at my job all day. That's actually my job is to push through negativity and, and make things positive out of negative situations. And if you're afraid of the, the confrontation, you're never going to actually reach resolution. So you have to go through the confrontation in order to reach resolution. Thank you. And I will second that. Conflict has a really bad reputation. But again, it's only through conflict that we're able to work these things out. 
And sometimes the biggest conflicts we have are right here in ourselves. We become very conflicted about what we need to do and what should we do. But you know it. You know it in your gut. You know racism when you see it. You know misogyny when you see it. You know what's being directed at you. Yeah. So you told him to just call it out as racism, right? But there's so many people out there that are like so close-minded to that, and they're like, racism just doesn't exist. So as soon as you bring it up, they're just going to close their mind and not listen to anything else that you have to say. So what do you do about that? Keep saying it. <laughs> You're going to have to keep saying it. That's the only way to calm. Segregation was one of the biggest heinous racist acts this country has seen in modern times. And that was the loss of African American faculty across this country. Okay. But is that racist? No, we're just not hiring. We can't find any qualified people. Yeah. Yes. So I was kind of noticing off of what you said um, earlier, which was just that. Um, thinking about when it's appropriate to call out other people's, like if you see a microaggression and you don't experience it yourself, that it's also important. Like you want to challenge that, but also you don't want to define someone else's. Like when is it appropriate to step in? When you see a microaggression happening that you're not experiencing, mm -hmm. like in a workplace situation, like you were talking about, mm -hmm. um, stepping in but not speaking over. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I would say if you want to be a really good ally, then ask that person that um, you know the microaggression was aimed at. Okay, that was aimed towards. Sometimes being a good ally means talking to people and means following their lead and not charging in all the time to rescue, because that's just as racist as a microaggression sometimes. Um, so ask. We're afraid to ask people stuff, you know. It's okay, I think we need to ask. I think with allies, the best thing specifically is for like white allies, the best thing for you to do is not to like ask yourself, what can I do to help these people? It's to ask yourself, what can I do for my people to help yes. this situation? Mm -hmm. I think far too often we get confused with like helping as in going into another another race or ethnicity mm -hmm. community. So instead of, I mean, you know, <laughs> check you. <laughs> check you at the door. But also, like, um, just to speak, like, on that topic for a minute, it's like, yes, to follow that script as far as, like, white allies, but keeping in mind that racism, like, when, if you're a white ally and you're helping a person of color, in a situation where they have been impacted by racism is understanding that racism is a system that affects the lives of people of color and it also affects the lives of white folks. So like we're all being affected by the impact of racism. So for us to dismantle that system is something that benefits like the whole of humanity so we can like reclaim our humanity because racism is something that's destroying our ability to behave in human ways with each other. Um, but uh, I wanted to talk just like about, um, could you talk a little bit more about implicit bias? So how, again, that's still under the system of racism, mm -hmm. but how is it like, could you give like from an academic perspective, like existing in this environment, 
the difference between like what a microaggression would look like and then our experience of our experience of implicit bias. Like, did you understand my question? Kind of. So when I think of implicit bias, I think more of like something written into a textbook or a way that a teacher teaches a class, whereas like a microaggression is more like a physically manifesting act. Right. Yeah. yeah. Implicit bias fuel those microaggressions. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So when we have these things that we're not aware of and we're also well intended, that when we perpetrate these microaggressions, oftentimes people go, I didn't mean that, right? They're not aware of what they just did. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, we don't have access to everything we think and everything we feel, right? And I know that sounds like, yes, I do. I know exactly how I'm feeling, right? Or I know exactly why, why I do a particular thing. That's not necessarily true. And there are many reasons why we don't have access to that. I could do a whole lecture on that, uh, but I will spare you. Um, but the research is there. The proof is there. Um, the IAT, so there are ways of actually getting at it. Uh, I've, another thing that I've also learned is kind of like when, when I'm learning about like all these oppressions, it's kind of, uh, you know, for example, um, there's, if you're going to be for social change or like you really want to unchange or undo some of the things that are going on, you have to kind of like be in allies with the other people that are being oppressed too. Yes. That makes yes. sense? Yes. Because yes. I feel yes. like we, we, we think too much of like, okay, I understand like, you know, like if we're talking about from a, a person standpoint, like blacks are they're at the bottom, you know? Mm -hmm. But then there's the Hispanics, there's the natives, you yes. know? Yes. There's so many people that are being, uh, you know, just, you know, I feel like destroyed, uh, yes. being targeted. Yes. You know, dehumanize. So, yeah. if you're gonna be for, you know, one issue, you should help those around you right. with the issues that they're doing too. Right. Exactly. Thank you. Solidarity. Solidarity. Yeah. Very good. It took me the longest time to connect uh, in the environmental movement with being black until yeah. somebody put the words together: environmental racism. And I realized that neighborhoods of color were being used as dumping grounds for chemical companies across this country. So it's all the same river. We're all swimming in it. Okay. Um, social justice is just that, you know? It's not just us. Okay. It's all of us. Say something. Um, I just got back from uh, Shay Taylor's uh, protest, and I feel like it's a lot of mixed reviews about what happened. I think that people place judgment off of what media has portrayed that man as, and they're not looking at it as that's a dash cam and that's not protocol. I went down there and I seen no community leaders, none. I'm really concerned that people take what the media says and then that's how their reaction is. That's, that's their course of action. Well, Fox News said it has to be right. He spent 22 years in jail. He deserved to die. Our own mayor was like, it was just due. It was, it, I think it was, it, was, it was the right thing to do. And I want us to stop looking at the media so much and look in your heart first and your morals and, and actually tell yourself, is it right or is it wrong? Would you want it done to you? Because at the end of the day, he is a felon, yes, but he paid his debt to society. And in no way, shape, form, or fashion could they know he was a felon when they shot him. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Uh -huh. I just want to ask 
if um, microaggression is only applied to race and racism, or is it applied to gender and the other social? Yeah. Oh, it's no. Yeah, any marginalized group, any, yes. Microaggressions apply to race, ethnicity, gender, sexual identity, age, class, ability, all of it. Yes. So, uh, so you said microaggressions are applied across uh, any marginalized group. Mm -hmm. Even in the way people collect data, statistics, is yes. that yes. very much Oh, yes, it is. Because on yeah. this campus, there are only 40 students of Mexican or Hispanic origins that are born domestically in this country. So, um, the problem with that is that they say, so that means there is no outreach program to Latino students. Because they're in the area, level? there's no outreach. Okay. So they tried. So all all of our Latino students spend uh -huh. a quarter in the ESO uh -huh. to learn English uh -huh. or our international programs. Right. So is that that's racism as an institution because yes. we don't have that's institutional yes. racism. So that's also yeah. a microaggression by grouping. All I'd say of it's systems. macro. Macro. Yeah. I'd say it's a large <laughs> aggression. It's not a small one. That's a big one, and that is an institutional issue. Last one. I just wanted to ask you to explain a little bit about the situation because there's some of us that don't know. Okay. Uh, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, uh, a dash cam was, well, I'm going to tell you how I got it. I watch the news every morning. I really don't like watching the news, but I think I need to inform myself. There's not a lot of positivity in the news. I'm just saying. Right. But the first thing I heard was a convicted felon, cop shot a convicted felon. Not cop shot a man. Cop shot a convicted felon, right? So Sunday evening, a task force approaches the man in a white car. The door is open, and he's a foot away from the car. He's about 6'5", about 285. And if anybody's seen the dash cam, the officer said, get down on the ground, put your hands up, get down on the ground, put your hands up. If you look at the dash cam, he has his hands up and he's trying to get down. It's kind of difficult when you're that big, the door's open, and you're right next to the car. Not one officer said, can you back up away from the car? Not one officer said, freeze, don't move. No protocol was made. They had assault rifles and shot him four times in his back. Okay, four times. That's execution. A police officer is supposed to be accountable for each bullet they shoot. But when the media, pro when they got the story, the first thing they said was he was a felon. And if you look at the evidence, they said he had heroin, black tar, heroin, cocaine and a, a gun with a holster. If you look at the pictures that, that was their evidence, perfect knots on heroin. The package looks perfect. It looked like no one has touched the packages. My question to them is, what is the protocol? Why is the tactical force shooting him with a rifle? In his back, no doubt, when he was following commands. Now, you don't have to believe me, but I watched that video about a hundred times already. I'm trying to find a justification. It's my thing. Because I don't see any. If he was following everything that you was giving him, you didn't tell him to back up. Now, him being a convicted felon, I didn't know that. I knew it when the, the news portrayed it. But they didn't even say his name. They just said, convict, cop shoot convicted felon. He spent 22 years of his life in that penitentiary. Paid his debt to society. He's only been out a year and three months. Yeah. In journalism, they're not wrong in saying he was a convicted felon. As a convicted felon myself, if I was in the same situation, I can't get upset that they were. It made. Uh, 
He's a human he first. Wait, wait. Polarizing it may be. But we can talk afterwards. But the journey. Yeah, I I don't want to shut this down. Um, but my time's so. up. <laughs> um, and this is what we're talking about. We need to continue these conversations because I seriously don't want to shut this down. So please keep talking. Thank you for your time. Um, keep making noise and keep talking about it. Thank you. Thank you.